Welcome to Upside Down Mirror, one woman's true story of a twin flame journey, a reflection of true love, true hate, and everything between, where everything and nothing matters at the same time. shatter as mirrors of shadows cut through indestructible layers testing the sands of time. Welcome to episode four of Upside Down Mirror. If you remember at the end of episode three I just found out that Gabe was married. I was heartbroken, devastated. I felt shattered, splintered. To be quite honest with you, I was so fragmented that even now when I think back, it's hard for me to remember things from that time. So I believe as I'm even doing this podcast, sharing my experiences with you guys, I'm reintegrating myself, actually healing myself. When someone becomes so traumatized or they find out information that's so shocking, in order to save themselves at times, their soul fragments. Pieces of them will splinter off because they can't deal with the trauma. When the time is right, those pieces will come back and make them full once again. And that when the time is right is usually when someone is in a safe relationship and they can be intimate with themselves and with the other person without being scared. So right after I found out that Gabe was married, Sean actually started to contact me on Facebook, which, you know, now I look back, there's no such thing as a coincidence. But back then, you know, I just remember thinking, well, that's coincidental. He was contacting me, just asking me how I was, um, you know, what was going on with my life. I did not tell him too much. You know, just basically, I was single at that time because I had decided in my mind you know, this is enough. I'm not going to be with Gabe anymore. Sean was still with his girlfriend, as far as I knew, because I was communicating with him through Facebook and it seemed as though they were together. But he did want to let me know that I deserved someone who would treat me well and he wished me the best of luck. I remember feeling a pang of jealousy just because it looked as though he had been treating his girlfriend so well and here I am just being heartbroken and devastated. I loved Gabe with all of my heart. I was 100% spellbound, even after finding out he was married and the thought of completely letting him go was unbearable, but yet at the same time, I really wanted to be able to. About a week after I found out he was married, his wife called me because she had found messages on his phone. I had not seen him since then. As I said, I was trying to stay away. I told her the truth and at first she accused me of lying, but eventually realized I was telling the truth. She packed her bags and left him as she headed to California. He was left behind, very confused and fragmented himself. Gabe's wife was not talking to him. I was refusing to be intimate with him. He was becoming quite frantic and because of his supervisor's lack of taking my allegation seriously, he was still allowed to moonlight at my practice. This is because they were already his identified patients. So I was seeing him in the capacity of work, however, not romantically or intimately at this time. Everything came to a head when about 30 patients were left sitting in the waiting room and he didn't show up for work. 
I was furious at his lack of responsibility and accountability. I desperately had to figure out how to get coverage, get everything settled at work, make all of the 30 patients happy, and then I left, heading to his house to figure out what's going on. When I got there, I was completely shocked. There was an aluminum foil covering the windows. He had made a Faraday cage to sit in. And his whole house had a strong smell of urine in it. This was really bizarre. He was telling me that there was something trying to attack him with electromagnetic frequencies from the cell phone tower next to where he was living. Then he looked at me and he said, I know that this has something to do with you and your military experiences. On a side note, I was in the army over 10 years before this in the reserves. He knew about that experience, but after getting out, I was no longer in the service or had any communication with any military authorities at all. But he believed at that moment that I was in cahoots on a secret mission with somebody from high military intelligence or also CIA to destroy him. Of course, I remember thinking this is convenient that he goes crazy right when he has so much explaining to do to, to his wife and myself. However, I was trying to talk him down and get his mind in a rational place so that he could start to move forward with his life and I could figure out what was going on with the practice. I took him to a local restaurant, just told him to relax. The waitress came and gave him the orange juice that he ordered. He looked at me and started laughing, saying that who did I think he was, that I think he was that stupid to drink the orange juice. And then he got up, slammed the orange juice down, walked out, went to a local store, bought orange juice, came back to the restaurant and said, he's going to drink orange juice that is not poisoned. At this point, it was kind of odd how his moods would go from being extremely paranoid to completely relaxed within seconds. He noticed three of his friends sitting across the restaurant and he said to me, come, I'll introduce you to them. And I said, no way, I'm not going to be introduced as your girlfriend or really any kind of personal relation to you after what you did, telling me that you were single when you were married. And everybody here knows that you have a wife because this is your local town where you guys lived. At my refusal to be introduced to his friends, he became extremely angry, he looked at me with the devil in his eyes, pure evil coming from his eyes, and just walked out of the restaurant. We were in the same car and I needed a ride back, so of course I followed. We were headed home and he pulled over to the side of the road. He stopped the car and he looked right at me, straight in my eyes. He took his fingertips and started to trace my eye sockets, first the right and then the left, and then he took his fingertip and started to trace my cheekbones as well. He looked in my eyes, you know, and his brown, sparkly eyes that were once filled with charisma were dark and vacant. He looks right through me and says, I know that you have microchips in your eye sockets and in your cheekbones. What a beautiful place to put them. I know that they're watching me. I know that they want me. Why don't you just tell them that I'm willing to be on their side and work with them? Instead of them torturing me with these electromagnetic frequencies, Rebecca, why don't you tell them I want to be on their side? Of course, I was a mental health professional and had dealt a lot with schizophrenic and bipolar patients with psychotic features. So I knew this, but not in the capacity that I was dealing with it now. It was in my life. It was in my love life. It was happening to somebody who I dearly cared for and loved. The whole entire time, as I start talking to him about who they is, he says, I know you think I'm schizophrenic. I know you think I'm bipolar. However, however, there are entities, there are beings after me. 
There are forces after me that want to hurt me, dark forces. So I just got him to calm down as much as possible. And we went back to his house. Shortly after we got back to his house, I found out that I wasn't the only person he was acting like this around. There was a knock at the door and three police officers were there with paperwork to emergency petition him into the psychiatric ward of the exact same university that he did psychiatry work in. Of course, this paperwork was filled out by the doctor who refused to believe me when I told him earlier what was happening. It turns out he was doing, doing many bizarre things at work, like putting people's cell phones in the refrigerator to protect them from, from people listening to their conversations or to protect himself from being followed or attacked. He was walking and talking like a robot. He seemed very agitated. He began mumbling to himself. According to these doctors, he was displaying a lot of psychotic and schizophrenic features. So he was hospitalized against his will, handcuffed, taken to the hospital. The next day, he asked me to please come and see him to help him. So of course, I went right to his side. There was a panel of high profile psychiatrists around him. He had basically every psychiatrist at the university in that hospital room at that time. We're talking about the psychiatrists who teach psychiatrists. They told him that he had to be hospitalized for 30 days in order to become stable and keep his position at the university and to his position within the residency. The hospital that they wanted to put him in was about 50 minutes away. So instead of taking him against his will and making him go in an ambulance and handcuffing him once again, they gave him the choice to go home, pack, and then he looked at me and said, and she can even take you to the hospital. He did a very good job of talking and making all of us believe, very educated people in this room, people who are highly trained to read behaviors. We were all convinced that he was completely serious about checking himself in the hospital for his own well-being. When Gabe and I returned to his house, he looked at me like I was crazy when I told him to pack his stuff that I needed to take him to the hospital. He said, I'm not going. And I said, well, you promised them. He refused to go. I still stayed. My love for him was so strong that I wanted to make sure that he was okay. I turned my phone off because I really didn't feel like dealing with any more drama for the night. And he and I went to bed. In the middle of the night, he started shaking and sweating profusely. He excused himself and went downstairs on the couch. I knew that he was being overtaken by something. This was all happening so fast. It was so hard for me to understand. I was caught in between the world of mental health and spirituality. I knew that this was not just schizophrenia or bipolar with psychotic features. I realized that he was being influenced by an outside force. I walked down and looked at him on the couch shaking and I asked him if he was okay. He said he had to come downstairs because he didn't want to do anything to harm me. Immediately, I got a sense of well-being, though. I think I was told by my angels not to worry that I wasn't going to get hurt. I know that sounds crazy, probably with anybody listening to this, why I would stay in a situation like that. However, I knew I was going to be just fine. I knew I was divinely protected. I left him on the couch, went back upstairs, and went to sleep, or slept as best as I could under the situation. In the morning when he woke up, he seemed to be rather calm and collected. I knew he had a lot to deal with, 
because the higher level psychiatrist at the university and his main job obviously thought that he was going completely insane. I had my own life to deal with. I was very upset, very heartbroken, very betrayed. I knew the best thing for me would be to leave him for good. I had to go back to work, so I left his house. It was very obvious at this point that everybody was in agreement with Gabe no longer seeing patients, that he wasn't in a state of balance or of health to be able to take on patients. So immediately I got a letter at the practice where his moonlighting privileges had been revoked by the university. On the way back from his house that day, I got a phone call from the head psychiatrist at the university he worked at. She was extremely concerned. She was very upset with me for staying at his house that night. She said that during their assessments, he realized that I was the center of his emotions. He told the psychiatrist that the only time he felt okay, the only time he felt at peace is when I was near him, as though there were demons trying to attack him. And when I was in his presence, the demons were unable to get to him. This is exactly what he had told the staff. She was very concerned for my well-being. And like I said, I knew I was going to be okay, but convincing her of my decision-making skills at that point was quite difficult. So I had to listen to a big, long lecture about how I was putting my own life in danger when I had children. The whole thing was just a mess. So I imagine that my decision in staying away from him probably had a lot to do with some of the next moves that he made. He was no longer allowed to come and work for me and I had decided I didn't want to see him. I wanted to try to heal and get out of this situation. My heart went out for him. I had extreme compassion, but I just needed to put my own pieces back together. I think this made him decide to torture me. The next thing I know, I get served with papers where he's suing me for $2 million because of that paper I signed that one evening when he was at my house, agreeing to split the business up in reference to stocks and bonds. It was very ambiguous. I knew that if this were to go to court, it wouldn't go anywhere. However, in Maryland, you can sue somebody for basically anything for $140. So that $2 million lawsuit caused me a lot of problems and a lot of money. During the two months between the time I received this paperwork and leaving his house, I did not see him at all. Even though my heart was ripped in half and I missed him every single day of my life, even I had a breaking point. He was leaving me horrible text messages about my involvement in the military and him being attacked, calling me names that I would never repeat on this podcast. He was basically losing his mind. My lawyer was rather costly and told me that it was obvious that he wasn't going to win the lawsuit, but the loopholes I had to go through were a waste of time and a waste of money. And his exact words to me were, it's very obvious, Rebecca, that you were thinking with your vagina. A couple months passed before the court date and I felt fragmented, as I was saying. I felt like I was in many little pieces trying to walk around. I remember losing quite a bit of weight. I was in a daze trying to put the practice back together, find a new psychiatrist, explain to the other staff what happened. I was immensely supported within my practice, within the staff that were in the management team, but it was still very, very hard. So the day I went to court for this $2 million lawsuit that Gabe had against me, 
I was definitely not his biggest fan. But seeing him, once again, I remembered how much I deeply, deeply loved him. He was sitting not too far from me, and we were waiting for the judge to come in. I was so shocked. He looked at me and said, Rebecca, take a picture. We're going to use this for our scrapbook, and just chuckled. And I was thinking, how many levels of evil can be in one person? But yet at the same time, I was searching his eyes just to try to find the Gabe that I once knew, the Gabe I fell in love with, the Gabe that I would never, ever forget, the Gabe that haunted my soul every single day, every single moment. The judge walked in, looked over the paperwork, took a deep sigh, talked to his lawyer and said, we're missing some crucial paperwork here. This is going to be postponed for another few months. I actually breathed a sigh of relief. I practically ran out of the courtroom to my car and of course he followed. I could hear him mumbling as he followed. I wasn't sure who he was talking to, but I just quickly dismissed it. He ran up to me and looked at me and once again, it's almost as though instantaneously got that sparkle back in his eyes and said, hey, Rebecca, we need to talk. I really wanna spend some time with you and talk about everything. If you've ever been in love and you look in that person's eyes and your brain tells you, run, run so fast and never look back, but your heart just aches for their touch, for their breath, just for them, then you know where I was at. So I gave in and said, okay, let's talk. Of course he said, you know, you and I both need to relax a little bit. We need to release, we've been through a lot. And he booked a hotel with the jacuzzi tub and we met there later that night. We made love and it was a bittersweet connection because I felt so good being in his arms, so good as he made love to me. But then I was disgusted with myself for putting up with all of this, wondering what is wrong with me? Why does love have to be this hard? It was interesting being with him because he says things that normal guys would not say, that normal guys might be thinking. So we were in the hot tub right after making love and he's staring at me, looking at me. He said something that I will never forget. It has stuck with me until this day and it has actually helped me to learn to love myself. It was a huge slap in the face. He was studying me as he said, I'm trying to figure out what your limit is. How much shit will you actually put up with? He said, is there no end to what I can do to you? I was actually speechless when he said that, but it was like he was reading my mind because I had the exact same question. We are attracted to our darkest shadows. Our darkest shadows are the pieces of us that we try to hide and ignore. The pieces of us that we have not paid attention to are brought into our awareness. These dark shadows come alive in the people that are with us in our everyday lives, especially the twin flames that we attract. When you ignore your dark shadow and hide it, it's always going to be revealed to you. And when it's revealed, you'll have such a deep attraction to it because it's the part of you that you should have learned to love a long time ago. If you would have loved it the way it should have been loved and gave it compassion from the beginning, it wouldn't be hurting you. My shadow was being reflected in him and I was obviously pissed for being ignored. Was I ever going to get out of this trap? I found out by spending that night with him 
that he still had those strange paranoid behaviors. But I knew that this man was deeply psychic, probably one of the most psychic people I've ever met in my entire life. I knew that this was not just paranoia. There were forces, very supernatural forces at play that I couldn't even begin to imagine at that time. He would mumble and talk as though he were talking to people. You know, some of the things that he would say, he would refer to humans. He would say, well, humans need this or humans need that. And then he would tell them to stop following him. The next morning at breakfast, as we were walking, he was looking behind his shoulder as though someone was following him. He told me I had to follow him as he went into a store and hid behind a clothes rack. I would say, what's going on? Who are you hiding from? He would look at me and say, as though you don't know, you know who I'm hiding from. He played it off to the point where I thought he went back to quote unquote normal. We got back to the hotel room and then once again, he got that evil look in his eye. He said, give me your phone. He wanted my phone again because this time I think he was looking for some secret confidential confidential information from the military or other high profile government agencies that he thought I was a part of. Of course, I wouldn't give him my, my phone. So I ended up with a whole bunch of bruises on my arm that time. This time I got a restraining order. The judge granted a six month restraining order from Gabe. However, just because Gabe was not physically with me during those six months doesn't mean a thing because his energy was all over me. Pretty much I was walking around in a catatonic state, once again, completely fragmented. One day I looked on my Facebook and saw a message from Sean telling me that him and his girlfriend just broke up asking me how I am. I still can't fully remember the details until this day. But I do know I ended up making plans with him to go to a masquerade ball in my local town. I hadn't seen him for three years at this point. Was this just a coincidence or was this the exact synchronicity that I needed? I tried to get excited about Sean coming. I remembered, I didn't feel, but I remembered the energy between Sean and I. Feeling was still not a part of me. I felt very numb. So Sean made arrangements to come down. I believe he even stayed the whole weekend. He took me to the masquerade ball. But what I felt when I saw him for the first time as he drove into my driveway and got out of his car was definitely different than when I first saw him. I really didn't feel that much. I mean, physically speaking, he was very attractive, so I couldn't deny that. Very attractive man, a good date, someone that you would be very proud of taking to the masquerade ball. He kissed me, he said hello. He just gave me a peck on the lips. The kiss even felt different. I just felt like that there was no one home inside of me. I tried to fake enthusiasm, give him a hug. We talked small talk. I remember we didn't even kiss. It was like he didn't like kissing me on the lips and I really didn't protest. I was going with the flow. We had an amazing time at the dance. I would say we never really connected that deep. I felt like he could, he was a friend or he could be a friend at that point, but there was really no connection beyond that. I was attracted to him. Like I said, as though you'd be attracted to someone who was physically attractive standing right in front of you, but that deeper connection just completely turned off. 
I do believe it was because I was not inside of my body. Sean was very supportive just in general. He was a very supportive person. And I remember us talking, but I know I didn't disclose any of the events that were going on around me because I didn't want him to think I was crazy. Of course, every other thought in my head, even when Sean and I were together, was about Gabe, how much I missed him, what he was doing, trying to figure out what went wrong and why these events were happening in the way they were. When it was time for Sean to leave, he gave me a quick peck on the head, hugged me, and he left. I really only thought about him for about five minutes before he was completely gone out of my reality. I did ask him about his relationship though during the conversation when we were together. He had said that whole time he was in a relationship with the girl that he was with, it was as though he was getting his soul sucked out of his body. He said that if he wouldn't have left, he would have been soulless. And I remember thinking, hmm, because that's how I feel right now, soulless. I'm going to end episode four here, and I invite you back to join me on this journey with episode five of the Upside Down Mirror.